How's that? Is that coming? Is that coming? Oh, there we go. <laughs> and now you get double. Now we're, is it working? Um, now we are, are going to hear third talk in this room. Um, but just a little reminder, I hope you are tweeting. Uh, don't forget there will be a grand finale at 4.30 in room D105 with special prizes. Uh, we have some posters up for grabs if you're interested. With this, let me pass the floor to Jim Perrin, who's going to talk about ARM. Um, Thank you. So my name is Jim Perrin. Um, I've been with the CentOS project now for a little over a decade. Um, 
and in that time I've taken a few different roles with the project. Uh, most recently, I've been working on uh, handling ARM builds for the data center. I apologize if I sound a little hoarse. I am. Um, you guys are lucky this isn't a talk happening through interpretive dance. It was a bit of a rough night. You don't want to see that. So um, for about the last year, uh, almost exactly a year to the day, um, I got my first ARM64 box, um, a bit hush-hush here, sneak this home from FOSTEM, work on it, see what you can do with it, see what you can make happen. <coughs> and so we begin um, the initial build of CentOS 4 64-bit ARM hardware. We started with the 7.0 release and plagiarized quite heavily from some of Fedora's patch sets. Thank you, Peter. Um, but the majority of the, the 7.0 code built. There were a few issues that, that we ran into. Um, most of them were easily solvable, a few patches here and there to, to pull in. That all worked fairly well. And then I got a call from a few of the, the Red Hat guys saying, what, what are you doing? Wait until 7.1. Why? Well, we can't tell you that. Just wait until 7.1. <laughs> Okay, fine, the, the beta's already out, it shouldn't be too much longer. Um, so I still continue to do a lot of the build, but I kept it kind of private. Do we have any, not, is there anybody here who's not Red Hat in the room? Who's not in the family? Okay. Um, so while this was going on, um, I still continued to build, but I was kind of keeping my eyes on the, the package sets and the package lists for 7.1. The, the sources for RHEL 7.1 drop, and miraculously, hey, there's a, a RHEL sub port for it. We have full-on RHEL sources. And a lot of the packages or patches for ARM look suspiciously like the things that I've been you know, ripping apart from Fedora and backporting into the RHEL patches. So it, it, well, the other direction. The other direction. It, it, uh, it, it built a lot easier the, the second time around. But we had issues with... Um, and, I can't say we had issues. The vendors that we were working with seemed to be having issues, mostly focusing around distribution. They were trying to get a lot of the, the Red Hat stuff out there. They wanted to be able to give it to customers. They wanted to be able to get the, the testing out there. And they were struggling with being able, struggling with being able to, uh, to do some of this. So with what we have, um, we offer essentially a, a more easily distributable method for pushing a lot of the same things. What I'm trying to get to is a place where we have full parity with x86-64 architecture on ARM for data centers. I want it to be just bog simple and easy to use. There should not need to be a different set of instructions or installation methods or anything else. The hardware shouldn't, the installation for the software should not be the differentiator. The hardware should be. I want the chips to compete on their own merit. If the low power benefit for ARM or, or more cores for ARM makes a difference, great. If you want power, great, go for that. But I want the chips to compete, not necessarily the software stack. And who in here is familiar with the pain of U-boot, other than Peter? So that's one of the things that initially we have avoided dealing with. Um, my focus initially was on ARM in data centers. We've got a pretty good handle on that now. So these days we're focusing a little more, as, as more 64-bit ARM consumer boards come out, we're getting more requests from the community. Yes, Geekbox, thank you. Um, the, the Pine 64, things like that. As these boards are coming out, we're getting requests for the 64-bit build of ARM on these devices. But I've been focused on UEFI and, and the, the um, server boot standard specs, the, the, the different well, things. It's fairly high for Fedora as well, they focused on UEFI and mm -hmm. the SDSI standard simply because that was the hardware we had available to test on. And it's nice to not have to deal with vendor-specific things. When you can just say, this is the standard, this is how we're doing it, please come play. On the phone, we will send your masters to you. 
now there's a threat. But it's not all fun and games. I've been playing both sides of the fence. It's kind of what I do. Um, the vendors that we've been working with have also been trying to get additional patches in. I don't have to worry about SLAs, we're community. So for some of the hardware vendors, we're able to move a little faster. We're able to pull in additional patches that um, either the Fedora folks may look at a little. Sorry, did you say extra crap? <laughs> I said additional patches. What, what, how you interpret that is entirely up to you. Some of the patches, uh, so one of the vendors, and I'm, I'm not going to name names because as someone so kindly reminded me, there is video and there is a microphone and I, God, I don't want a lawsuit. Um, one of the vendors, when I told them that we would accept patches and, and push faster kernel versions or at least faster um, patched versions of the, the standard CentOS kernel, they said, great, and they shipped me one bulk, I, I want to say it was like a 19,000 line patch for the kernel. There were multiple patches. One of them was around 19, and it was like, oh yeah, that whole ACPI thing. We don't need that, we're kicking that out, we're going back to device tree, we're doing this, we're doing... No, in, in no way will I accept this patch. Just full stop, absolutely not. I don't claim to be a, a, a kernel developer. Let me ship this to, to a few other people, but this doesn't smell right to me. I mailed it to a few of the other folks who screamed and then started laughing, so I felt I was right in kicking that back. Um, but that was just one instance. We have a number of other, there, there are four other vendors that are working very well with us, um, and for the most part, they are just pushing slightly newer versions or, or added support features for the hardware that we've already got. So some of the additional, um, um, Newer patches for Mustang to support IPMI, things like that. That's great, bring it on. And so what we're doing is we're running a bit of dual stack development. We have the traditional CentOS focused build on ARM, and then each month we're putting out limited feature release improvements that are mostly focused around the kernel, but the, the occasional tool set patch. Um, and so we've been doing that now for roughly six months and we've had a lot of community uptake for it. Um, in handling the server world with that, we are, I'm completely ignoring my slides here, so I'm, yeah. Uh, essentially what we're doing is distributing the base, distributing updates, extras, we have a few in that. Um, I haven't thrown a lot into extras mostly because a large chunk of that should be coming from Apple. So I've been putting on my other hat, leaning on the, the um, Apple release engineering folks, the, the Fedora release engineering folks, and saying, hey, can we please get Apple rebuilt for ARM? And they keep telling us, no, we're focused on other things like um, power. No, so no, that's entirely not true. We need to have hardware <laughs> in the data center that we can use to build it because we need to be able to plug it into the private coaching mm -hmm. And your magical requirements for functioning hardware that might be supported, uh, you know. And so I can honestly say we now actually have enterprise level hardware sitting in a rack in the Phoenix data center. It's been waiting for network for two months. One day, sometime this year, we will get network and we will then be able to start to look at Apple for our 64. And by then, I will almost have been over the process and not like quivering in the corner from doing the little end, uh, power little Indian Apple bringer. I'm not sure we're doing the talk dynamic correctly. Is, is the speaker supposed to troll the audience or is it the other way around? I'm... <laughs> when it comes to arm, well. Okay. <laughs> you will see a lot of updates for people. Mm -hmm. for so here. the other thing that we have is an experimental repository. Um, Peter, you're probably going to want earmuffs for the next little bit of this. We have been, um, so for the, the, the uh, 7.1.1503 release, that was primarily focused around Docker builds. Um, the initial Golang bootstrap to get 1.5 support for ARCH64 built was unique and special in all sorts of interesting ways. <laughs> 
uh, little details like, hey, maybe the page size shouldn't or you know, might maybe want to match what everything else is doing on the system. Which of three So um, we got Golang support built in. We got Docker support built in. It, it works. It is mostly. I said mostly. It is mostly operational as long as we're not getting unique with all sorts of fun Docker things. So that's where we're, we're putting the experimental repo. Um, community. <laughs> the other half of it is we've got a chunk of the community user space right now that is pushing very hard for certain compatibility layers. And this is where I say you're gonna want your earmuffs because ILP32 is a thing. And who's familiar with this? So for whatever reason, there is a large chunk of the ARM community who would like to have backwards compatibility for ARMv5, ARMv6 applications, a few other oddball things that, that may have been built against old hardware. They want to just run this natively on ARCH64. They equate it to, hey, I can run you know, I386 or I686 applications on NX8664. It is not remotely the same thing when it comes to ARM. They are aware of this. This is an ongoing discussion right now. This may land in experimental, it may not. Um, my requirement has been there has to be a good faith effort to get things upstreamed that stands a fair chance of success. And right now that last bit is what is killing the ILP32 movement. There, there have been patches pushed upstream to both the kernel and glibc folks who have roundly slapped it around and said no. Um, so until that changes and until there's a patch set that looks like it might actually maybe get committed, I have a really hard time saying yes, we can pull that in, even in an experimental state. So my only comment about that is um, we've always said Mm -hmm. And that worked really, really, really well. Um, the issue, well, but you know, it, it's your community. You, you can make a rod for your own back because I don't need to deal with it. So it the. Won't be going anywhere that <laughs> no, th that is absolutely not something that I would push out for. Uh, consumption other than in an experimental thing. Um, and even that is questionable. It, it is an ongoing community discussion. They have been asking about it, for, uh, asking for it on the mailing lists. Um, what we're working on short to medium term right now is actually adding in um, AR64, ARM64 hardware to CBS, the community builders that Brian Stinson was talking about earlier, the, the infrastructure that Fabian was bringing up earlier. Uh, we're plumbing hardware into this and into CI so that we can validate and make sure that everything we're doing on the ARM side is exactly as it should be on the x86-64 side. Again, we're, we're trying to go for parity. Um, we have recently gotten boxes stood up in the data center that actually got network connectivity. That was a miracle, but it happened. It's connected. It actually works. Uh, and so we're going to be starting the community. Is, is Niels DeVos hiding in the room? He was in here earlier. I don't know if he snuck out. He's not, okay. Um, so we have the, the Gluster builds coming online as our first proof of concept. And then the RDO folks have been roundly tossed under the bus so that we can get OpenStack uh, going on AR64 very soon as well. Um, It, it works. I, I have it running. It works. I just need to do it community. It has to be out in the open, not just in my private build system at home where it's sketchy. Um, okay, yeah, we're doing good. So essentially, we have the 
uh, CI infrastructure coming up, we have all of the, the server space that's needed. Now we're getting more into the community boards. We, we've kind of waved the mission accomplished banner for the server stuff, and until the hardware becomes more generally available um, for server hardware, there isn't a whole lot more that we can push. Once we can turn the community builds over um, for the various projects, the, the Glusters, the Cephs, the OpenStax, once those communities are able to make their builds public, the only real market left for us to push for is the community stuff. But all of the community hardware is ignoring UEFI. They're, they're doing the same old thing they've always done. They're, they're doing the same traditional approach because U-Boot is a thing and as much as I hate it, it works for their use case, for what they're doing. It is cheap. You, so the high key has a special brand of hate in my heart right now. <laughs> I have a build set up for the high key. It works. You can go get it right now. Building the disk layout table, the, the, the p table.bin, is a bit of a pain. And if I take the <laughs> if I take the p table that they ship, which is admittedly for their, their uh, um, Debian-based, their Ubuntu-based distribution. It works, but they have their UEFI directory set as slash boot, not slash boot slash EFI, like Fedora and other sane distributions have. So it becomes an interesting dynamic in finding the right EFI files and putting the image together correctly, because the installer wants to do one thing, and they're disk layout wants to do something different. It also gets really particular with the fast boot update to move the image from one to the other. It's exceptionally te temperamental about the size of the image. So even if you're well under the onboard disk space, it gets finicky about, you know what, I don't need to write this whole file. I'm just going to truncate that last 100 megs because you didn't really need that, did you? I'm not shocked. Um, but it actually implements most of the UEFI services in native Ubuntu. We had discussed this. This is hopefully a saving grace where Fedora and CentOS are going to be collaborating, possibly commiserating, and drinking heavily. How many of you went to the beer event last night? Excellent. Um, so the patch set that Peter's talking about allows you to shim some of the UEFI features into a, a soon-to-be upstreamed U-boot and hopefully fake enough of the funk that we can get things booted and working normally. Neither one of us has tested this yet. We're both pinning high hopes on it and we'll probably be sobbing and crying and, you know, gnashing yeah, of sorry, teeth. I, at the moment. Wave it around. Um, so one is the gate box, which I have here. Um, the other is Pine 64, which is apparently sitting in my post box, or probably on my front porch getting rained upon um, at home at the moment. Um, neither of those currently have upstream U-boot support. Um, I intend on getting out a roll of gaffer tape and a bunch of bubble gum and, and, and trying to make that a thing in the F24 time frame. Um, and so that I don't actually have to um, drink heavily up and deal with Anaconda and install a process and, and various other bits and pieces, um, I'll be playing with the UEFI patches to see if it works. So it'll be a watch the Fedora arm space over the next couple of months as we ramp up towards Fedora 24. This is part of the whole... Uh, it, keeping it all in the family thing. So in this, for, for the ARM space right now, Fedora and CentOS are, are playing reasonably nicely together and collaborating fairly well for the majority of it. Um, it seems to be going well. We have um, 
So I have the Pine 64. It arrived about two days before I came here. So I, I haven't had a chance to play with it other than to notice, hey, that's bigger than all of the other arm sockets. But you know, for $15, I'm not going to care. Is there anything else in here that I care about showing? No, okay. So yeah, basically the only, the only thing that I haven't mentioned here that's in slides that I'm really uh, sort of passionate about is in addition to the installer and, and Pixie support and everything else um, on the server hardware, we're doing uh, developer disk images, which we essentially have the user land support with the kernel bits ripped out and some brief instructions for the different vendors to drop in their own kernel bits. Um, you say tomato, I say, you know, it's, it, yes. Some of it, I, I would desperately love it if the ARM folks would stop doing one-off kernels and forking them on GitHub and claiming that that's upstream because you can go look at the code and they're one monolithic, just giant patch set. I might be a little bitter on some of this. Uh, does anybody have any questions? Feel free to interrupt me. Peter already has been the whole time. It's fine. <laughs> I, it's not a problem. Yes. The they don't suffer from the same issues. <laughs> they are quite happy to pull them the kernel trees and throw any. They are creating any all issues. new issues. And it's kind of interesting because in Fedora slash CentOS slash uh, Relsa, we've always said it needs to be upstream. We can't maintain a hundred different kernels for this, and that's been very much our principle. Um, it, cost Fedora quite a bit in the ARM space in the early days. It's now laid out because we support about two or three hundred individual devices out of the box and it amazes me every week when someone comes along with this weird and wonderful device I've never heard of and I've gone, oh God, what do they want me to do with it? And they just go, actually no, it just works. And it's like, wow. Um, if you look at the Ubuntu CVE stream for the ARM kernel, <laughs> <laughs> they, they are literally pumping out hundreds of them and are having massive problems keeping up with CVEs. Take a look. Uh, very recently, who's, who watches the, the kernel CVEs and the whole keyring buffer thing that happened, what was that, two, two, three weeks ago? Yeah. Fedora had updates for this because they do kernel updates. We had updates for this because we do kernel updates. Most of the Ubuntu and, and other images don't. They're, the update structure just is not there. They will throw an image out, they wave their hands, they say, look, it's supported, it runs, and then it's abandoned. The user space isn't usually a problem. The user space marches right along. The kernel and the, the tooling around the kernel, um, the occasional glibc, gcc, that's where things get interesting. If you look at Ubuntu, if, if kernel is in universe, then you can assume that it's randomly supported. <laughs> That's a very uh, polite way of I saying it. I work uh, on Ubuntu and I got this Samsung Chromebook. I, it was perfectly fine for us. <laughs> so I just pushed Linux Chromebook kernel into it, right? Which was quite old, but it was work, it gave working image, right? I don't remember when last time I, I worked on it, right? I don't use any more Ubuntu anymore, I don't develop it. I will not be surprised if this kernel is still there. We see that very frequently, um, not to pick on individual folks, but the, the hard kernel guys specifically. That's the one where I run into it a lot. They'll do one, hey, we, we forked this kernel at you know, 310 or, or 42 or whatever. Here it is, come get it. And then there's just no movement on it from that point on. I'm not opposed to it as long as it gets, you know, patches and is maintained. But it's, it's that second part. It's the patches and maintained that tends to be a problem. <sighs> so it, the, the kernel side and, and the Ubuntu side, they, they tend to wave hands and say mission accomplished a lot faster than we do. We, we have higher standards. And, and when I say we, I mean, you know, RHEL, Fedora, CentOS. 
if I tell you this hardware is going to work, I'm putting out updates for it, I'm not going to expose you to CVEs. The only exception to that is the developer disk image where I load the gun and say, here, if you would like to shoot yourself, you may. I'm not going to. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? That's a very good question. I don't know. They don't tell me these things. <laughs> um, it is still a, uh, it's beta developer tech preview something. That. I don't know what the plans are with 7.3, but the user space is 100% merged in, looks exactly like all other architectures of RHEL. Um, it's officially, that's why I said user space is yeah. um, And it's there, but you speak to your account manager about it. And the way that it's working right now is if you're a, a RHEL customer, you get you know, access to the RHEL betas, except this one. This one you have to go talk to your account rep and get added into the super secret squirrel thing and then you get it. It's not even that super squirrel, you just have to go and speak to your account manager. Which is an added step that, why? Anyway, not for me to judge, not for me to say, I don't care. Um, I'm under the impression I have been told, but again, we're, we're not in any way related to the business unit, so I could be wrong, feel free to correct, been doing a great job so far. Um, <laughs> I love taking cheap shots at Peter. It's fantastic. Um, Red Hat is not pushing the updates. They, because it's the, the preview, they, they drop the release. This is what you're working with. It's expected that it's not a, a production thing. Uh, we are pushing updates for it. Every time there is a user space or a, a, a kernel update or CV that comes out, we're patching the kernel outside on our own but the user space gets the same updates that everything else does. So for us, it is, it is a fully... I don't believe that's entirely true. It may not be. That may have uh, changed. But it, 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 I think we can just leave it at it's, it's there. Speak to your account manager about it. And any future intentions about it are not public. And I, I personally don't even know because I've got more than enough to deal with. And um, you know, basically what's in use for these press announcements various other bits and pieces. So more questions. I have 10 more minutes to kill, and I've completely ignored my slides. So what, what do you guys have? Hit me with arm questions. KB. The builder is available now. Um, for the stuff that is already built for the SIGs in Koji, their option is essentially bump the release version because Koji gets particular about NVR. Um, and so if they, the, the next iteration of their build where they have a slightly newer uh, uh, NVR string, then they'll be able to tag in the ARM builds and move on with life. Uh, if they want to build an equivalent version now because, say, the Gluster folks don't want to run different versions of 3.7, which is an entirely sane stance, and I wouldn't fault them for that, um, then they would have to do a scratch build, and we would have to work with them uh, in the interim to make that scratch build an actual real honest-to-God thing. Um, if they want to tack a 0.1 on the end of all their builds, then great, we can go do that now. The CI hardware should be coming into the data center in the next month to month and a half. At that point, I'm kind of at the mercy of the, the data center guys to get it plumbed in and networked, and I can throw estimates out for time frame all day long. I have no way to back that up. The, the, the testing can work on virtual machine. We can get that set up. 
but it still has to have a network to talk to the outside world so that the community can actually get to it. And that has been the, the majority of the roadblock, I believe. So the, the hardware installation, the, the managing for the data center type stuff is entirely outside of my purview. I usually just throw stuff at Brian and say, hey, make this happen. And, and he goes off and talks to people and screams and yells and stuff either happens or doesn't. So I yell at him, he yells at other people. It, it's a nice little cyclical thing. So. Anything else? Does anybody have other ARM64 boards other than Geekbox or Pine64 that they would like to see supported? Is there anything else that anybody is aware of? Other than the high key. So the question being, um, do the SIGs need to care about individual hardware differences? And the answer is, it depends. If they have kernel modules or if they are relying specifically on something, um, some specific function of the hardware, in that instance, then maybe. If it's entirely a user space thing like Gluster or something along those lines, the user space works just fine and they, the, the SIGs won't even notice. They, it, they just trigger a build, it builds, they move on with life, everybody installs their software and they're happy. So the big difference I see um, when it comes to the AR64 hardware is whether it supports SDSA or not. And mm -hmm. one of the biggest questions I always get is will the likes of the Pine board support SDSA? And Never. The answer is it is not actually possible to do so because it requires, um, while you can a UEFI bootloader in there and various other bits and pieces. Um, there is specific requirements of certain bits of hardware, like a particular type of real-time clock, a particular type of serial console, and a few other bits and pieces that all the cheap devices actually don't ship with. So, so I guess I guess but that's part of the distribution challenge. Is that should companies like Cluster care? No, no. It's basically. I one of the things they've done with the um, V8 spec um, is they've standardized a lot of stuff and there is a dot 8.1 and an 8.2 spec which adds extra functionality in, but it's no different than you know different generations of the Intel processor where you know they had MMX and then SSE and then SSE 2, 3, 4, 4, 1 and so forth. Most of the newer feature specs that are coming in um, and I'm not sure what is public and what is not, so I'll be very vague and hand wavy. Um, a lot of it is a no-op if it's not supported. So for some of the new things, if it's not a supported feature, it just won't happen and the software will continue on as if it doesn't. Maybe it's a little slower, you may not get the acceleration that you would expect, but it's not going to outright break. In a lot of cases, the new functionality Correct. Like in ARM V8 first specification, crypto instructions were optional. In 8.1, they are mandatory. CRC32 is a wonderful thing. Yeah. So, so in, in most cases, um, from most of the user space stuff, um, it's not going to make any difference at all. It, like, if it runs one, in one location, it, should, it will run everywhere, unless it's a hardware specific bit of functionality. Even down to if, if we had a SIG that wanted to change up some of the Anaconda bits. If Anaconda runs, then it won't make a difference because that would be user land enough that it shouldn't matter. Yeah. 
It's just getting to the Anaconda bits with, you know, hey, does it support Pixie? Do we support this bootloader? Do we have this type of memory register actually available? Or did we save three cents by not putting it there on the board, which is the case frequently. So, any other questions? No? So the, the question is, what happens when Red Hat releases their official thing? We already have the, the source dump of the kernel. We get that now um, as Red Hat delivers the sources into git.centos with all the other distribution code. We build that and the initial uh, uh, release kernel, because that's the newest kernel at the time, that goes into that, that initial release. So we have a roughly equivalent kernel there. What we're doing for these monthly builds is we're taking that kernel and adding in a few uh, uh, vendor fixes or, or updated patch sets on top of that. So it's always an additive process. Um, when the, the new RELSA kernel drops, those patches, whichever vendor has supplied them, is uh, uh, on the hook for porting those if they haven't already been merged in by Red Hat through some other means. So if um, the initial build was, I want to say, a 3.18 or 3.19 kernel. Um, and the Zen folks gave us a, a kernel patch to enable Zen support. This last kernel drop for uh, the 7.15.11 build was a 4.2 based kernel. So we had to get a new patch set from Zen that covered the differences between uh, 3.18, 3.19, whatever it was, and 4.2. If that kernel gets rebased again to something you know, further on down the road, then we, we walk that process forward. So we're, we're starting from what the, the rel kernel source is, the same as we always have in the past. We're just adding a few additional things in there as the, the community need for that arises. So we are still compatible. We're just also walking forward a bit more. And in, in some cases, if you go from, say, 3.18 to 4.2, in that example, it could be that that patch set that the vendor provided is now upstream. Mm -hmm. Right. With, with our patch requirement to the vendors of there has to be a good faith effort in getting this upstream, a lot of it is really just a timing thing. The, the vendors may have missed the window for 4.1, and so they're, they're scrambling to try and get it into 4.2, 4.3, you know, 4.5, whatever. And it's been accepted. It just missed the merge window. So, hey, it's been accepted. We can see it. I can go on LKML and, and find this. I'm fine pulling that in ahead of time because I know it's already in the upstream. I know it's going to work its way down. And once we hit that point, I can drop that patch off my list. I don't need to worry about it anymore. And, and we move on and, and cycle through. Yes? I don't care. <laughs> I, honestly, um, so Microsoft has been very beneficial in helping to drive some of the server standards. Um, I honestly haven't looked in depth at what they're doing on a lot of the, the user boards, but a large chunk of the Microsoft code requires ACPI. So because they need ACPI for their distribution, it's been beneficial in, in leaning on the vendors to push ACPI in, further into the, the standard, but beyond that, Whatever Microsoft's doing, I haven't touched Windows in three years, and I consider that a badge of honor. I have no intention of shifting that. So, all right. Thank you all very much.
Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you.